Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to church. We are small, but we are mighty. We invite you to rise up and join us this morning in worship. Church. Thank you uh, so much for being here to worship with us today, and thank you to those of you also uh, joining us on live stream. It's a beautiful Sunday morning, and uh, we're so happy to be here with you today. Thank you again for being here. Everyone on your way in, should you grab some message notes and announcements, if you don't mind pulling them out at this time. I'm going to go through them pretty quickly. This morning, Pastor Ryan's going to be continuing a series in 1 John. If you uh, missed the last couple weeks of that series and would like to catch up, we have plenty of ways you could do that. We have a uh, live stream on Facebook that you can go and watch old uh, versions of our service. You can also uh, tune into our podcast, and we have a YouTube channel. So plenty of ways you can get caught up with the, the, this sermon series, and uh, looking forward to the, today's message. That will be in 1 John chapter 3. There's uh, Bibles at the end tables. Feel free to pass it down if you need one. If you wouldn't mind, turn over to the back for our announcements this week. Uh, we've been talking about this the last few weeks. At the end of the month, we're going to be having a baptism and church picnic, which we uh, it's our annual thing. We love to do it every year. Uh, the main reason for this is the baptism, but it's also a great, great time to get together with our church family and hang out and have some good food. So that'll be August 27th, 12 p.m., right after service. It'll be at Bicentennial Pond. We'll have directions here. You can also just uh, plug it into your phone. And then there's a place you can sign up to bring some food if you um, wouldn't mind bringing a snack or a dessert or some kind of side dish to share. We'll have all the main dishes uh, covered by the church. Uh, if you would like to be baptized, um, it's not too late to do that. This week, Pastor Ryan's going to be leading a couple uh, baptism classes. Um, it's also, if you're not interested but want to learn more about baptism, you're more than welcome to join the class for that as well. There's going to be a youth class this Wednesday 
August 16th, and that's going to be at 7 p.m. downstairs in our church cafe. And then we're going to have an adult uh, class that will be on Friday, and that will also be at 7 p.m. downstairs in our cafe. And Pastor Ryan, just request, if you don't mind, just email him to let him know that you'll be coming and to confirm that you'll be coming. And his email is right on here, ryan at stpaulswire.org. So uh, a couple different ways you can learn about baptism, and we look forward to the end of the month where we'll have that the baptism picnic. Building healthy families. Uh, some of you may have remember them from uh, we had a Valentine's Day event this past year with them. We also helped out with an Easter event that they ran. Uh, they're going to be having a kids fair on Saturday, September 9th from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. It's uh, they, they need our help and they, they're looking for us to provide some volunteers. It's a great way to get involved and learn about a new organization that uh, just reaches out to the community in some really great ways. It'll be, uh, I think, it's, I believe in Manchester, uh, the event. And if you uh, want to volunteer or you have any questions, you can feel free to email me or you can email Sandra at St St Stevenson, who is uh, running the event. She's, she's the one who asked for our assistance. And uh, Peter and Karen Colson can also answer any questions you might have about the event. So uh, hopefully we can um, provide some people. And again, it's a great time to help and get involved in our local communities. And then the final announcement today is uh, something that we've announced the last few weeks. We opened up a memorial fund for the Lori family. Uh, as many of you know, um, Ron and Josh uh, are, are, are having a tough time uh, with everything going on. So one way that we can help out is by donating to, to their page. Um, it's a, the, the site is on, you could go to our website to uh, donate there. You could also go to um, send right here when we uh, have our donation later in service. You could donate cash or check to them as well. Um, many of you know that Ron lost his wife, uh, Lisa, earlier this month. And, uh, so plenty of ways that we can help out, and also we can continue praying for the family as well. At this time, if you wouldn't mind pulling out your connection cards, uh, we ask everyone every week to fill out one of these cards. Great way to let us know you're here worshiping with us. A uh, couple things you can check off. We're hoping to add a little section here that says kids, kids only, um, for, for a couple requests we've had. And then on the back, we also have a place for your prayer requests and praises. You could uh, put these cards in the basket later in service. We'll have an opportunity during communion time. There's also going to be a basket at the uh, back of the table, back of the room. Now, would you uh, mind standing for today's invocation prayer? This morning's prayer comes from Johann Haberman, who lived from 1516 to 1590. Almighty and merciful God, you are the strength of the weak, the refreshment of the weary, the comfort of the sad, the help of the tempted, the life of the dying, the God of patience and of all cons consolations. You know full well the inner weakness of our nature, how we tremble and quiver before pain and cannot bear the cross without your divine help and support. Help me then, O eternal and pity pitying God. Help me to possess the soul of patience to maintain unshaken hope in you, to keep the childlike trust which feel, feels a father's heart hidden beneath the cross. So shall I be strengthened with power according to your glorious might in all patience and long suffering. I shall be enabled to adore pain and temptation and in the very depth of my suffering to praise you with a joyful heart. Amen. At this time uh, is a time where we share the peace of Jesus with, with one another. And uh, you could do that with a handshake or a fist bump, a uh, simple hello. Um, but at this time, may the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with each and every one of you this morning. Please extend that peace to one of your neighbors.
I love to tell the story of unseen things above. Jesus and his glory, Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story because I know it is true. Satisfies my longings like nothing else can do. I love to tell the story to be my theme in glory to tell the old old story of Jesus and his love I love to tell the story tis pleasant to repeat what seems it's time I tell it more wonderfully sweet. I love to tell my story for some that never heard the message of salvation from God's own holy. Oh, 
Lessons from 1 John, and we're going to be picking up right where we left off last time, which is in chapter 3, starting in verse 11. So if you want to follow along in your own Bible, I encourage you to turn there now. Chapter 3, verse 11. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for this morning. Uh, we thank you for the chance to worship together and to study the scriptures together. And Lord, we just want to be open to receive whatever it is that you want to teach us today. Uh, we invite your Holy Spirit to work in us and among us. And all God's people said, Amen. All right. Chapter 3, starting in verse 11. For this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Do 
Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit that he gave us. So you may have noticed that John has a couple main points that he likes to return to over and over in this letter. He's happy to keep coming back to them because they're that important. And in this passage, once again, he emphasizes the importance of keeping God's commands. But this time, he's very clear about what he means when he talks about God's commands. He's not talking about things like dietary laws or Sabbath regulations or holiday observances. He's not talking about, you know, fasting on Friday or your hairstyle or, or dress codes. He has two main things in mind, right? Verse 23, this is his command to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. Believe in Jesus and love one another. These are the commands that he has in mind. And we should note that those two commands are related, right? Jesus, if we believe in him, right, we should recognize that he commanded us to love one another as I have loved you. If we believe in Jesus, then we're going to take that command seriously, right? If you say, I believe in my doctor, and she writes you a prescription, and then you just throw it in the trash, well, you don't really believe in your doctor, right? Jesus wrote us a prescription, love one another as I have loved you. And so if we really believe in Jesus, then we should be following that prescription. We should be taking it seriously. And John says that this prescription was part of the original message that they received. For this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Now, isn't that interesting? See, in my experience, most of the time when someone says, we shared the gospel message, they mean, well, we shared the good news that Jesus died on the cross for people's sins, and then we invited them to accept that, to believe that. And of course, that is certainly part of the core message of the gospel, the core message of Christianity. But when the people in John's church first heard the gospel, they did not just hear, Jesus died on the cross for your sins, so believe that. They heard, Jesus died on the cross for your sins, and so you also should be forgiving and love one another. Right? That was part of the core message. Those things went together. That, that's core to the gospel. Now, the word love translated from agape, it is used a lot in this little letter. You may have noticed that. I believe it is used more in this little letter than any other book in the New Testament. And that raises the question, do we understand what love really is? What are we thinking of when we hear, hear that word, love? I hope it's clear that John isn't talking about romance here. He's certainly not saying that unless we have a romantic partner, then we are walking in darkness. If that were true, then Jesus spent his life walking in darkness. The Apostle Paul was walking in darkness. So that's definitely not what John means. Romantic love can be a beautiful part of life, one of a great gift uh, from God, but you don't have to have a romantic partner in order to love as Christ loved us, right? So, what is love? Well, John helps us to understand what love is in this passage with both a negative example, so what love is not, and then a positive example, what love is. 
So what is love not? Well, he points to the example of Cain. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. Now, the story of Cain and his brother Abel, it comes from the fourth chapter of Genesis. And about two months ago, we looked at that story together. If you were here, hopefully you remember that. Uh, Cain and Abel were the sons of Adam and Eve. So they are the second generation of human beings that are featured in the Bible. And just one generation into the human story, violence enters the picture when Cain kills his brother Abel. So here's a way of thinking about this. If the story of Adam and Eve is the story of sin entering into the world, then the story of Cain and Abel is showing us what sin ultimately leads to. Right? It leads to violence. It leads to brother turning against brother. Now, Adam and Eve's real failure, their primary sin, was that they did not trust that God is truly good. That was the essence of their sin. Eve was deceived into thinking that God told them not to eat from that tree because he wanted to withhold something from them. Eve was deceived into eating from the tree because she was convinced that God was being selfish and controlling and withholding and dishonest. And so she came to doubt God's goodness and love, and so she took from the forbidden tree. And then, of course, the story of Cain and Abel comes immediately afterwards. And so it shows us what happens when humanity doubts the goodness and love of God. When we do that, it is only a matter of time before we turn against one another. Unless we can believe that God is real and trustworthy and good, then we are going to have trouble loving other people well. So, John presents Cain as the example of what love is not. Do not be like Cain. Now, it might seem obvious. Well, of course... Love does not look like murder. We should not be murderers, right? But, you know, if you consider human history, it might not be that obvious to everybody. Throughout history and even today, there are many people who think that faithfulness to God looks like killing the right people. That's what the 9-11 hijackers thought, right? It's what every religious terrorist thinks. It's what some people identifying as Christian have thought when they burned heretics at the stake or uh, when they supported the Crusades. If we ever find ourselves thinking that faithfulness to God looks like killing the right people, we should remember John's words. Do not be like Cain, that first murderer. Now, John says that Cain was motivated to kill his brother because his brother's actions were evil, or sorry, because his own actions were evil and his brother's were righteous. And what John seems to be saying there is that Abel's goodness was intolerable for Cain. He couldn't stand it. Now, why would that be? Well probably because it was a reminder to him of his own evil actions, right? The contrast, Abel's righteousness, brought out for Cain an awareness of his own, his own wickedness, and he felt judged by that. Now, it wasn't that Abel had actually done anything wicked to Cain. He had just tried to do the right thing, but that provoked this rage in his brother, and so Cain sought to remove his feeling of inadequacy by removing Abel. And when you think about it, that is the same dynamic that we saw at work with Jesus and those who opposed Jesus, right? It wasn't that Jesus had done anything wrong. It was that he had done everything right. And so Jesus' righteousness exposed the hypocrisy 
of the religious leaders of the time. And that provokes some people to want to kill Jesus and to try to make that happen. So, sometimes you lose friends not because you did the wrong thing, but because you did the right thing. And now your presence is intolerable to them because they've chosen differently. Now, of course, part of the reason that John brings this up is because there had been the church split, right? If you've been here, you know we've been talking about this. This letter was written in the wake of a church split where a lot of people had left and John was trying to reassure those who had stayed. And what John wants them to understand is that they weren't rejected by these people because they had done something wrong, but because they had done something right. And the story of Cain and Abel shows and the story of Jesus, right, that sometimes that is what happens. Now, I put all that out there, and now I also want to give a word of caution. Don't always assume that any rejection that you experience is due to your righteousness. Okay? It may be because you're being a jerk. Right? One of the worst things that a Christian can do is have an arrogant, judgmental attitude, right? And when you have that arrogant, judgmental attitude, any rejection that you experience, you perceive as some kind of persecution. And what we need to remember is that sometimes we're rejected because we're like Cain, not because we're being like Abel. But at the same time, a passage like this reminds us that we can also be rejected because we are like Abel. Caleb? All right. Or like Jesus. Right? So, we always, we always have to keep that in mind, right? And we need to have the discernment to recognize which it is if we've experienced some kind of rejection. Is it because I'm being more like Cain or being more like Abel? And there are a couple things that you can do to help yourself in the discernment process, like sitting down with a trusted brother or sister in Christ and saying, well, this is what happened. Can you be honest with me? Someone that you can really trust to be honest with you. Do you think the rejection I'm experiencing is because I've done the right thing or the wrong thing? And then there's also, you can kind of interrogate yourself with some questions, like, was I rejected for being loving or unloving? Was I feeling envious before my rejection? Uh, did I feel hatred prior to my rejection? Right? These kinds of questions, they can be clarifying. Am I being more like Cain or more like Abel? But returning to the subject of love and what it isn't. So it's not like Cain. It does not envy. That matches what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13. It does not turn to violence. It does not seek to silence those who demonstrate righteousness. Right? People of love, uh, they don't feel judged by righteousness, but they may feel convicted. They may be humble enough to see another person's righteousness and then feel inspired to, to change, to grow. Right? So Cain is the example of what love is not. And even if you weren't paying attention when I read the scripture passage, I'm sure you can take a good guess at who the example of what love is, is, right? Of course, it's Jesus. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Jesus shows us the real essence of love. And the real essence of love is a giving of ourselves. A giving of ourselves. A giving of ourselves for the good of others. Love, agape, is more than just liking something intensely. Right? That is the way that the word love is often used in popular language. I love ice cream, which means I like it intensely. 
And there is nothing wrong with using the word love in that way. That's one of the ways that that word gets used. That's the way language works. No shame in that. But what we have to understand is that when John uses this word, when the New Testament uses this word, it means something more than just liking intensely, enjoying something intensely. You can, you can love someone truly and not really even like them very much or enjoy them very much, right? Because what love really is, is that giving of ourselves, that willing giving of ourselves for the benefit of someone else. And yes, ideally, that giving of ourselves is accompanied by an appreciation and enjoyment of that other person, right? That's, that's a good thing, that kind of feeling. Sometimes you don't have that feeling, but then when you start to give of yourself for another person, then it's, you start to develop some of those kinds of feelings. Right? But love, agape, the essence of it is this giving of ourselves. That's love. That's what Jesus demonstrated, even to the point of dying on a cross. Now, John is not telling everyone in the church that they literally must die for other people. There are certain extreme circumstances where faithfulness to God may require that incredible sacrifice. But uh, that's not really what John is talking about here. And I think that's important for us to recognize because if I just say, oh, you know, John is telling us, we've got to be willing to just die, right? Well, practically speaking, most of us are never going to find ourselves in that situation, right? So what does it really mean for us here? Well, you can see that John immediately applies it, and what's his application? Be ready to literally die? No, it is, if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? So, John says, think of the way that Jesus gave himself, even to the point of dying on a cross. If that's the case, then shouldn't we, who follow him, then be willing to give generously to those who are really in need? If the love of God is in us, then of course we're going to give generously to those in need, right? Generous giving is what love looks like. Now, right now, I could try to take some time to really hammer home this point about the importance of generosity. But what I would rather like to do right now is to just take a moment to appreciate the generosity that I've seen in this congregation among us. Because I really do believe that one of the the gifts, one of the uh, strengths of this congregation is its generosity. Um, We are not a huge church, right? Not by any stretch of the imagination. And I've been here for seven and a half years now, and we've never been a big church. We've been a bigger church than we are now. But throughout that whole time, there has never been a time when we couldn't pay our bills or when we couldn't pay the salaries or when we had to choose between paying the rent or paying a salary. There's never been a time where we couldn't meet our our outreach obligations. That's never happened in seven and a half years. It's amazing to me. And so I should say, many of you may be aware of this, but when I first got here, I made a choice not to know who was giving, and how much people were giving. Because I never wanted that to influence the way I operated. Like, I didn't, um, I didn't want to have in the back of my mind, oh, so-and-so is a big donor, so I have to make sure they're happy, right? I always wanted to be led by, you know, what God was leading me to do and say, rather than what maybe the biggest donors in the church might want. It makes sense, right? So, I, if you are an especially generous giver, I don't know that. 
And, um, or I should say, I probably don't know that. Um, and so th that comes with benefits, as I just described. The downside is that you know, I don't get to thank you personally for that particular thing, right? But I want you to know, I greatly appreciate it. <laughs> I greatly appreciate it, and I know that overall, you are all generous because, like I said, we've always been able to meet the budget. And that is not the only reason that I say that this is a generous congregation. I mean, over the last seven and a half years, I, there are more examples of generosity than I can articulate. But, you know, just a few recent ones that come to mind. You know, a couple months ago, uh, Ron's basement flooded. And, you know, right away, there were a whole bunch of guys that were just there to pump it out. And water kept coming in as fast as it was, go as it was going out. But they were there to pump it out and, and to move all that stuff uh, out of there is, is a big job. Um, but they were just there. They, nobody, there was no... No major summons or threats or anything like that. They, they just showed up. Um, you know, uh, a Yako Mitchell put together two meal trains for the Lori family, and people signed up to deliver those meals, to make those meals. I know that's not easy. I have a hard enough time feeding myself. You know, and so when you guys decide to put together a meal for somebody in need, that's, that's a beautiful thing. And... You know, there's always a little bit of fear in me when somebody says, oh, let's do a meal train. I'm like, will, will people make the food? We're a little congregation, you know, and that's awkward if a meal train is started, but then people don't make food. But, but it happens. Every time it happens. So you guys are generous. I remember a little while ago, um, Keith and I were talking to somebody about somebody in the congregation who had a need. And then just, you know, really fast, this person pulls out like $300 in cash and just, oh, give it to them. Who carries cash, right? <laughs> <laughs> but there it was, right? So, you know, I, I, I don't want to stand up here and just say, you got to be generous, you got to be generous, you got to be generous. I just want to say thank you for being generous. Keep being generous, keep putting this into practice. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. Um, it's, what, it, it's what God wants the church to be. Um, all right. So there's one last part of the passage that I want to address. Um, if you're like me at all, this was the part that when we read it, it was the hardest to follow. It's uh, verses 19 through 22. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. What does John mean there? Well... I, let me be very, very honest. Sarah and I moved this week. Uh, so I did not get to look at this as closely as I wanted to. Um, so, but I, I did look at it closely enough to know that there's debate about this passage and what exactly it means. And it probably won't surprise you to know that there are some people that think this isn't the best translation. Now, there's a lot of passages like that, but this one in particular is a tough one. Because there's several words in there that can mean different things. And uh, one, of, one of the, uh, the subjects of debate is how best to translate the word here that is translated as heart. Because we hear the word heart and we, we might think of something like our conscience. Um, but at least uh, one, one commentator that I read said that we should think of the word heart here as representing our ungenerous desires our ungenerous desires. Um, and so when John talks about our hearts condemning us, remember, remember, he's just talked about how we should be generous, right? So when he talks about our, heart, our hearts condemning us, 
We, we should think about when our ungenerous desires are really strong. And when he talks about our hearts not condemning us, we should think about when we do the right thing rather than listening to our ungenerous desires. So, <clears throat> here's what I, I think John is talking about. Sometimes you know in your heart that you should give of yourself in a particular situation, right? Maybe some money, some time, some energy, um, giving some attention to somebody in a particular moment. But the ungenerous side of you is rebelling against that, you know? And it's, it's trying to make some argument to say, not my problem. So John is saying that when our ungenerous desires are strong, we need to remember that God is greater than those ungenerous desires, meaning God is really generous, right? God gave Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. God is way more generous than what your ungenerous heart is telling you in that moment. And in those times when we feel overcome, uh, by our ungenerous desires, uh, we need to remind ourselves of God's generosity. And uh, in those times when we do manage to overcome our, our ungenerous desires, he's saying that we're going to find our relationship with God coming alive. It's going to become stronger because we're going to be acting in line with his will. And we're going to experience our prayers getting answered more because we're going to be asking for the kinds of things that God really wants. So when you hear that voice, that voice that is discouraging you from generosity, that voice that consistently says, not my problem, not my problem, not my problem, don't be too quick to give in. Now, I know this is compl complicated. Yes, there are some times when someone's need is not your problem. You cannot solve everybody's problems. You're not meant to be God. You, yes, we have to have some boundaries, okay? All of that acknowledged, okay? At the same time, do not be too quick to give into that voice. This is not my problem, all right? Remind yourself of the gener generosity of God, the generosity of Christ, who did not look at humanity and say, not my problem, right? But who said, I will give of myself for them. So commit yourself to living generously, because as you do, you will have confidence before God and will receive what you ask. Sometimes we feel spiritually dry. I think anybody who has tried to walk with Jesus to do this life of faith for an extended period of time experiences times of feeling spiritually dry, like God feels distant, uh, like things just don't feel as real as they used to. Uh, you, you might be thinking, I want to feel God, but he doesn't feel close. John would say, if you want to feel spiritually alive, be generous. Be generous. Become generous. Because practicing love, real love, is the key to bringing us near to God and experiencing his presence. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your generous love. Uh, and we pray that you would help us to embody that generous love to one another and to a world that needs it. And Lord, if we're feeling spiritually dry this morning, uh, we pray that you would help us to, to see ways that we might be able to give of ourselves for those in need. And um, we pray that as we do, Lord, we would experience your nearness and we would experience the ways that you meet us in prayer and answer our prayers. We give you thanks, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.
Jesus, you are mercy. Jesus, you are justice. Jesus, you are worthy. That is what you are. You died alone to save me. You rose so you could raise me. You did this all to make me a chosen child of God. Worthy is the Lamb that once was slain To receive all glory, power, and praise For with your blood you purchased us for God Jesus, you are worthy, that is what you are Jesus, you are mercy. Jesus, you are justice. Jesus, you are worthy. That is what you are. You died alone to save me. You rose so you could praise me. You did the soul to make me a chosen child of God. Worthy is the Lamb. Once was slain to receive all glory, power, and praise. For with your blood you purchased us for God. Jesus, you are worthy. That is what you are. Jesus, you are worthy. That is what you are. Now it's the point in our service where we continue our worship through the giving of tithes and offerings and the celebration of the Lord's Supper. Here at St. Paul's, the communion table is open to anyone who's put their faith in Jesus. And if you're not sure what that means and you'd ever like to know more, I encourage you to set up a time to meet with me. I would love to talk to you about that. Um, or maybe you could talk to somebody else that you know in the congregation. Um, I'm sure they would love to, to talk to you about that. When we participate in this sacred act, we are remembering Jesus' sacrifice, uh, his generosity, in the way that he commanded us to remember it. Um, the way we do uh, communion here at St. Paul's is we invite you to come right up to the table, and uh, I will say the body of Christ given for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. You can receive it with a thanks be to God or an amen. You have two options. You can either take one of the individual communion cups right here at the table, and um, then once you have picked it up, you can go and sit down and open it when you feel ready. Or you can receive the old-fashioned way right here at the table. Um, you can take one of the wafers, dip it in the juice, and take it right here. We also encourage you as you come forward to place in the basket underneath the communion table um, any offerings that you would like to give, we always want you to remember you should not feel like you need to have an offering in order to come here and receive communion. That's not how communion works. Um, but do remember that your offerings are how our church is able to continue doing what we do, and it's one way of expressing uh, your worship of God. And then also, please place in that basket your connection cards with any prayer requests you have written on the card, any questions you might have or ideas uh, you might want to share. Uh, we, we have a team that reads those cards every week and uh, prays over them. Let's stand together and confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you declare the Lord's death until he comes again. So as you feel called and as you feel led, come and receive God's holy gifts for God's beloved people. And everybody is welcome This is the Lord's house And everybody is welcome This is the Lord's house And everybody is welcome You can come on in Taste the bread of life The bread represents his body The wine represents his blood If your heart is right with him You can eat and drink in love Cause this is the Lord's house And everybody is welcome This is the Lord's house And everybody is welcome This is the Lord's house And everybody is welcome You can come on in Taste the bread of life God the Father, and I've got God the Son, and I've got the Holy Spirit now, these three are one, and this is the Lord's house, and everybody is welcome, this it's the Lord's house, and everybody is welcome. This is the Lord's house, and everybody is welcome. You can come on in, taste the bread of life. Thank you. 
is the Lord's house, and everybody is welcome. Is the Lord's house, and everybody is welcome. This is the Lord's house, and everybody is welcome. You can come on in, taste the bread of life. You can, you can come on in, taste the bread of life. You can, you can come on in, taste the bread of life. All right, church, ladies and gentlemen, we invite you to rise and join us for a closing song today. There is a river of gladness that flows from Emmanuel's vein. The sinner was plunged beneath the flood of God saved. Since then I walk in forgiveness. All of my guilt was erased Chains of the past Broken at last I got saved Oh, I got saved I'm undone by the mercy Jesus I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord I'm restored and made right You got a home of my life I got Jesus, how could I? Receive nothing but goodness. I've tested and tasted your grace. I was so lost till I fell at the cross and got saved. Oh, I got saved. I'm undone by the mercy, Jesus. I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord. I'm restored and made right. You got a whole my life. I got Jesus. I could I want more. Love of God gave me his pardon. Love of God won't let me say the same. Love of God calls me up higher. His will is stronger. Why I got saved. I'm undone by the mercy. Jesus. I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord I'm restored and made right He got a hold of my life I got Jesus, how could I want more? I'm undone by the mercy Jesus, I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord I'm restored and made right He got a hold of my life I got Jesus, how could I want more? Amen. Two quick reminders. If you are a youth, as in under 18, and you're interested in baptism, I'll be holding a youth baptism class on Wednesday at 7 p.m. And if you're an adult and you're interested in learning more about baptism, there will be class on Friday, same time, 7 p.m. Um, so just send me a quick email if you plan on coming. Let's say our benediction. While our service here has now ended, our worship is not ended. Because our worship never ends. Now go in peace to love and serve the Lord and to love and serve his people. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. I'm undone by the mercy, Jesus. I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord. I'm restored and made right. Got a hold of my life. Got Jesus, I cry one more. I'm undone by the mercy, Jesus. I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord. I'm restored and made right. Got a hold of my life. Got Jesus out of my